Hey everyone, welcome, welcome to another Wednesday BMR. It's Charmaine. I'm here with Jack. Super excited. The one and only Jazz is presenting a case. I know you are famous in the BMR world, my friend, but do you want to say hi? Sure. Um, I don't know about famous, but um, yes, you are. I'm thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here to actually present a case to Jack and Charmaine. I think it's been over a year and a half uh, since I last presented a case to you both, and it was about um, primary hyperaldo. So it's been a while, and uh, I think this is, this is a case that taught me a lot, and I feel like would be hopefully uh, equally as educational for everyone here. I'm sure it will be. I learned so much from you, so I'm super excited. Um, big shout out to Elena for scribing and Julia for doing teaching points. And yeah, if we can get the board, uh, we can get started. Jack, will, do you want to say hi and take the first aliqua? Hello, everyone. I'm super excited for this case. It's always a doozy when Jazz brings one. And yeah, happy to be here. All right. So... Um... I, there's just so we can all just be situated. There's a total of five aliquots. The fifth one will reveal the final diagnosis. I did send um, the case to Alina uh, beforehand, but if I'm talking too fast, just let me know. Um, so with that, let's get started. So for the first one, first aliquot, 53-year-old male initially presented in December with complaints of vomiting, abdominal pain, and weakness that led to a fall. All right, Jazz, do you want me to take it take it from here? I wasn't sure if you were just, okay. All right, so, um, you know, I think knowing that there's a much, much to come in this case, I will say that um, uh, I'm not sure how much progress we are able to make from this, other than saying that, you know, there's some good good pretense that, that, that the center of gravity in this case may be abdominal pain, right? We have three primary symptoms here. There's vomiting, pain in the belly, and weakness. And I would say of those three, the abdominal pain offers the most specificity, um, but even still, um, uh, I think the jury is out on where actually the action is, right? Vomiting can become from a whole host of things as can the sensation of weakness. So I don't think of them necessarily as localizing symptoms in the way that abdominal pain is. Everyone here by now, or I should just say most of you here by now are probably a, an expert in the general abdominal pain framework of VIPO, um, vascular for the V, organ-based inflammation for the I, perforation and obstruction. Um, in individuals who may have vaginal or uterine anatomy, we can think about ovarian issues, ectopic pregnancy, um, uh, and those things. Maybe um, uh, uh, not, not something that that's going to be at the top of our DDX here. Um, but I think at this point in time, I'm sort of really trying to get some flavor for which of those um, morbid causes of abdominal pain are we dealing with, if any. Um, and I think at this point, I'm thinking about the vomiting and the weakness as a sequela of the abdominal pain. But yeah, I'm curious to hear from you, Charmaine. What else What else are you thinking about here? Um, I love that framework uh, in terms of like the abdominal pain. Um, and I think one aspect of the case that I'm also kind of track is like that weakness and fall. I read dealing with like, you know, abdominal pain being center of gravity causing general asthenia that has led to a fall or are we dealing with the separate processes and the patient is like actually has neurological weakness that has led to the fall. So, and I think that is like where your neuro exam is going to be the most helpful. Uh, again, there are like certain links that we can draw on like between like abdominal pain, vomiting, like electrolyte abnormalities and such. However, I think like it's too early for that. So um, the other thing that would be really helpful, it would be the acuity of the symptoms for how long it's been going on. Because, uh, you know, as Jack mentioned, like uh, whether it's like hyperacute, acute, subacute, that will uh, um, that will uh, make us rethink um, the most like no misdiagnoses um, as well. Jazz, can't wait to hear more. Awesome. I was gonna. Tr I was trying to think of a clever Chandler pun, but I couldn't think of one on the spot. So maybe I, next I'm time waiting but... for one though throughout the three <laughs> more, my friend. <laughs> um, um, Jazz and I nerd out about the show Friends all the time. So uh, <laughs> sorry for that. Go ahead. No, it's fine. Uh, the second aliquot is going to be a pretty doozy. Uh, it's going to be further H HPI and then all going all the way to up to a physical exam. So. Um, so 
because of the abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, uh, abdominal pain, uh, the ED providers got a CT abdomen and pelvis, which showed um, the the lung zones showed the it showed bilateral ground glass opacities that suggested a possible aspiration versus atypical pneumonia. But for the rest of the CT abdomen, it was all normal. <clears throat> ED gave him one dose of vancomycin, and he was admitted to the hospital. Uh, hospital service and was continuous aftrax and azithromycin. Um, his initial testing for COVID, RSV, and flu were all negative. Blood cultures were pending. Um, given the generalized weakness and dizziness that he also com started complaining when he came into the hospital, a CT head was obtained, which did not show any acute intracranial pathology. Um, he also complained with the dizziness when asked more detailed questions. It seems like it was more concerning for maybe questionable ver uh, vertigo. That happened about, um, the first time it happened was four days ago. And it was, it would be like cyclic. Uh, it would come and go and come and go. But he kind of didn't really think that was his major concern. He was most more focused on his uh, GI symptoms. Um, he also complained of generalized weakness, um, but did but denied that one side of his body was particularly weaker than the other. He denied any fevers or chills, no chest pain. Um, however, in the last like two to three months, he had approximately like 25 pound weight loss, which according to him has been unintentional. Um, <clears throat> he, during his hospitalization, very shortly after he got admitted, he developed progressive respiratory uh, failure. Um, and at that time, a CT angio of the chest was done. It was negative for PE, but showed extensive bilateral airspace disease that, again, was similar to his um, CT abdomen and pelvis, and per radiology was consistent with possible pneumonia. Um, he had increasing oxygen requirement, went from room air to high flow in a matter of hours, and his oxygen oxygenation was still not the greatest. Therefore, ICU uh, was consulted and was uh, intubated. They did a bronchoscopy, which was consistent with alveolar hemorrhage. And at this time, repeat viral studies were positive for influenza A. His past medical history consisted of hypertension, pulmonary embolism that happened a year, a year prior to his presentation. Since then, he's been compliant on Eliquis. He um, also has a past medical history of essential erythrocytosis, which was diagnosed at the time of his pulmonary embolism. And his average hemoglobin and medical is 15.1 and 47. They tested him for JEC2 and the CALR, which were both negative. And because of that hematology felt polycythema vera and any type of my, uh, myeloproliferative disease is less likely. He has no relevant family history. He has a prior history of substance use, cocaine and marijuana, but quite more than 10 years ago, does not drink alcohol and does not have any other relevant social history. Vitals, his initial vitals, this was prior to him getting intubated. <clears throat> Blood pressure was 101 over 71. Tachycardic at 119. Tachypnic at 32. Low grade temperature at 100 degrees 0.4 Fahrenheit. He was in general acute distress, anxious appearing, malnourished. He was tachycardic, but no JVD. GI exam, no TTP, soft, non-distended. Extremities, plus one pitting edema by lateral lower extremities. His neuro exam, symmetric facies, decreased bulk throughout. Sensory, trace withdrawal in right upper extremity and bilateral lower extremity, but not left upper extremity. His reflexes were absent in knees and ankles bilaterally, but upper extremities were, uh, reflexes were fine. His, to his toes were down bilaterally. And is the end of Eloquatu. Wow. This is an incredible case and incredibly challenging. And it's, we can probably talk about this Alico for days. I'm going to maybe focus on the HPI and then, um, and then leave the rest to Jack to interpret. So we have like a 53-year-old gentleman who's coming in uh, with uh, mostly actually abdominal uh, symptoms, weakness that 
then the center of gravity becomes the lungs uh, with the ground glass opacities and the BAL that shows DAH. One thing that off the bat that I just, as I'm like going to focus more on the lungs, I don't want to forget about is like the abdominal pain. While like, you know, I think about the thorax and the belly as neighbors of each other, and perhaps people can have atypical presentations. I just worry whenever there's a CT negative kind of abdominal pain, thinking about you know, like metabolic ideology, functional ideology, all of those, and also like episodic episodes uh, that can um, that can uh, be missed in a regular CT abdomen and pelvis, and also like thinking about how well some of the vascular vas vasculature have been visualized. Um, so, like, I'll keep that in the back of my mind as we think about whether this is like a pulmonary syndrome versus like a more systemic illness that involves pulmonary and the abdominal um, region. So thinking about um, this patient who has a DH, um, who has hypoxemic respiratory failure found to have DAH and positive for flu, to be honest, like influenza is not one of the viruses that I associate with DAH. This can be totally a big gap in my knowledge. However, you know, in someone who has eliquis already, like I can imagine any uh, um, any uh, lung pathology um, can cause uh, more bleeding into the lung. Um, so in general, when I think about like diffuse alveoli hemorrhage, I think about like the vasculitides uh, in addition to uh, uh, that oftentimes take a, a lot of center incision, but it's like your pulse immune or immune complex mediated anti-GBM. So thinking about smoking history in this gentleman, uh, uh, which I don't, uh, which he didn't have, or uh, like infectious ideologies um, uh, that can uh, come to uh, mind as well. Like, you know, lepto is the one that often comes to my, uh, my mind as well um, as like some cancers that can cause it. Um, so in addition to, we talked about already like uh, vascular, uh, like um, drugs, like anticoagulation that puts you at a higher risk um, of uh, of these illnesses. Uh, so uh, I think uh, if I was taking care of this patient in terms of like uh, workup, um, in addition to like treating for the flu, I would be curious to see if there's any other infections at play, if there's any underlying vasculitides um, at play as well that has made him more prone um, to this presentation. Jack, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm totally with you. I think like we all, um, uh, there is like the very strong association of DAH with underlying small vessel vasculitides. Um, uh, and I think you're right that like there are some infections that can do it. I'm sure that there, that um, flu, I'm sure that there is a case report of it for flu, but I'm with you. I don't think of it as being a particularly strong association. Things like VZV, lepto, as you mentioned, hantavirus, these are the ones that, that, that uh, tend to be more frequently associated with DAH. And I think if we then would then layer in the exam, right? There's some features here that I think can help us hopefully narrow, narrow in things further. I love so much that you were holding on to the abdominal bangs. I think that's potentially going to be a key feature to not lose sight of because it is a bit peculiar to me. When I think about abdominal pain in the setting of vasculitis, it's more oftentimes a medium vessel vasculitis, things like polyarteritis nodosa that tends to do it. The small vessel vasculitis can, but it's not a hallmark characteristic feature. And so I think being open to um, the different ways that the abdominal pain can tie in here is important. The other thing that the neuro exam does for us, in addition to sort of saying, okay, this person's inflamed and they have terrible respiratory issues, um, is that we see that the neurologic system is on the hook here. And it's that they're being decreased reflexes in the bilateral lower extremities. And I think there's a few ways that we could spin this. One way is we could say, this is a person who's in respiratory failure, they're intubated, they're sedated, their reflexes may be masked for some reason. Another way that we could spin this is to say that, oh, there is potentially a, um, uh, a peripheral nervous system process that is sort of escalating and developing here and layer that on onto some of the hypotheses that you've already mentioned, Charmaine. We asked the question of how can vasculitides lead to a neuropathy? One question or one answer to that is the small vessel vasculitides can certainly do it. GPA and MPA um, can both cause um, uh, uh, injury or uh, neuritis. 
The caveat there is that that is usually a mononeuritis multiplex. So it's usually scattered and asymmetric neurologic system involvement. This is the person who may have a left foot or a left wrist drop and a right foot drop, for example, or they may have weak, they may have um, weakness in with plantar flexion in their, in one foot, uh, ipsilateral wrist, and then some weakness in the contralateral forearm. So it'll look almost in the same way that we think of reactive arthritis being an asymmetric arthritis. Mononeuritis multiplex tends to be one to a couple nerves that are knocked out, but it tends to be asymmetric. And this seems like a relatively symmetric process. Another hypothesis for the nervous system is that this is actually um, a sort of ascending or demyelinating peripheral neuropathy. And certainly we can see things like Guillain-Barre in the post-infectious or para-infectious state. And then the third hypothesis that I have in my mind is that actually this is um, a, a spinal cord process masquerading as a peripheral nervous system process. Um, there are occasionally moments where a myelopathy or a myelitis can lead to dropped reflexes. And that's specifically when the anterior horn cells are damaged. If we remember from neuroanatomy, the anterior horn cells are sort of where the motor units come off of and certain transverse myelinities or other processes that can get into the spinal column can preferentially impact the anterior horn. The hallmark one is polio, which we don't see often, but a variety of different viral infections and autoimmune processes, for example, enterovirus, West Nile virus, EBV, CMV, they can all cause this transverse myelitis. And it's similar in the same way that Guillain-Barre can be post-infectious or para-infectious, so too can a transverse myelitis. And so as we pay close attention to the lungs for the reasons that Charmid mentioned and, and then that workup, I think, again, as um, uh, attuning to the abdomen and seeing if this pain is just a sequela of sinister illness or if there's some sort of localizing feature there and trying to get a better understanding of what could be happening within the nervous system. The tools that we have for that could include things like an MRI of the brain and spine. It could include a lumbar puncture, or it may include things like EMG studies to better understand, are we dealing with a neuropathy or are we dealing with a myelopathy? Because again, all of these different categories of diseases, bad infections and certain autoimmune diseases can do it. Um, uh, uh, but I think knowing which structures are involved can help us shift the, um, can help us shift the probabilities there. Awesome. Um, could that discussion be any more fire? That's the best channel uh, impression I could do, Charlene. I'm sorry. That was perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> moving on to eloquent number three. So you guys uh, touched on a lot of things that the neurology team was also concerned for too. Uh, so I'm going to start off with some basic labs. Um, there was mild leukocytosis of 12 um, or 12,000. Uh, hemoglobin was 10.8. Uh, uh, hematocrit was 31. Platelets was 117. MCV was low at 68. The differential was unremarkable. The CMP uh, was basically within normal limits, except for a pretty significant hypocalcemia at 6.9 and hypomagnesiemia at 0 0.9. Iron studies, iron was low at 25. CIBC was uh, low at 129, but the ferritin was high at 975. Neurology wanted a, a, a pan imaging of his spine. Um, so C spine, T spine, and L spine were all done, MRI, and they were all negative. Um, B12 was sent, was within normal limits. Uh, we checked a methylmalonic acid just because the serum B12 levels are not the greatest. That was also within normal limits. Vitamin B6 was low. Uh, it was actually undetectable, but thiamine was within normal limits. Um, and that's the end of eloquat number three. All right. I just step out there for a brief second. So I'm sort of catching up and scanning here as we look. Um, yeah, I'm going to be totally honest. Um, I'm not seeing too many things that really move the needle for me here on the labs in terms of giving us any sort of specification. I'll sort of... Um, yeah, maybe I can just touch briefly on the spinal imaging. I, um, uh, uh, but yeah, that, and then I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts, Charmaine. Um, the pan spine imaging that's negative on the normal MRI, I think, helps us decrease the probability of a central cord, or I should say of a central process, um, something like a myelopathy. But certainly, um, we haven't evaluated 
in, in the detail that we may need yet something from the peripheral nervous system. And again, we said that there's a variety of different para-infectious or post-infectious neurologic complications. Most commonly what we see is Guillain-Barre. Um, and in the same way that there's post and para-infectious um, neurologic process, there can be para neoplastic neurologic processes as, as well. Um, and so I think perhaps with these MRI results, it might turn our attention more to the peripheral nervous system. We have done a very thorough um, uh, sort of serologic workup for a peripheral neuropathy. Um, I think about B6 being low can cause sensory symptoms and paresthesias. I don't think of it as causing this degree of weakness and dropped reflexes, which I associate more with demyelination. Um, but th I don't know if that's a fact or just a uh, 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 a knowledge gap for me. And so I would still say that without a sort of smoking gun, for lack of a better analogy of a, of a serologic workup for the um, drop reflexes, maybe something like an EMG, because that can help us again, sort of get clarity on whether this looks like a demyelinating neuropathy um, uh, or uh, an alternative kind like an axonal neuropathy. Um, but yeah, that's about all that I have for this here. I mean, what about you? Ah, uh, Dan, that was perfect. <laughs> I felt you're a neurologist too. I didn't know that, Jack, but I shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> um, I think I can focus on the labs a bit. So um, thinking about like his anemia, to, I love it. Again, like we often talk, think about deltas, like, you know, with blood pressure as well. Like we always like, what is the baseline here? And because of his essential erythrocytosis, he lives a little higher in the 50s. So that again, uh, shows a degree of anemia that he is. This is all due to his DAH or is there another source that we have to uh, worry about? Um, the playlist of 117 is interesting to me often as we are like thinking about like autoimmune. Um, I feel like a lot of the, especially like ENCA, the ones I, I don't often see thrombocytopenia with uh, some of these vasculitides. So some things to note. Um, in terms of these electrolyte abnormalities, I'm thinking about if any of them can be related to uh, myopathy as well. So repleting those and like maybe getting an ionized calcium as well. I'm curious to know if he has gotten a lot of blood products um, while a his hemoglo if he was like hemodynamically un uh, um, unstable. Um, so curious about that in the setting of like a uh, hypocalcemia um, as well. Um, so yeah, I'm curious to hear more from you, Jazz. Awesome. Um, so the fourth eloquat, um, after extubation, it was noted the patient had some ptosis um, and due to the weakness plus the ptosis, an LP was done, um, which showed mildly elevated protein. So it was 46 with our lab, the 40, 45 is the upper limit of normal. Um, so. Um, normal glucose, clear and colorless fluid. There was two nucleated cells. Lyme and syphilis and HIV was also sent. It was negative. Um, so due to the ptosis, there was concern um, um, for uh, you know a uh, peripheral process and a CT chest was done uh, and it was negative uh, for a thymoma. Um, and due to the ongoing concern for myasthenia gravis and acetylcholine receptor antibodies um, returned negative, and the MUSK antibodies was also sent, and it was also negative. Um, and we were the the patient was supposed to have an EMG, but um, there was some delays in for the EMG to get done. Um, but this is what the data was coming in real time. So the next aliquot would reveal will, it will reveal the final diagnosis and it will be followed by with some teaching points. All oh, right, I'm not sure what the final diagnosis is. So i uh, love to, maybe Jack, we can talk through this um, adequate uh, together. Um, I think in terms of like uh, ptosis, um, yeah, I think like my senior gravis was a great thought here given um, the weakness that was also uh, appreciated as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think about like, you know, local processes that can cause it and then systemic processes uh, that can uh, cause it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I still worry about an autoimmune uh, presentation in this patient, um, to be honest with you. Um, I've missed a lupus a bunch of time. Um, I think like the DAH could be um, uh, and uh and like the cytopenias also, uh, uh, but I've never seen ptosis with that. Um, so yeah, that's 
where I'm, my brain is mostly going, Jack. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm with you. You know, I think, um, oh, how do I say this? I, I think I'm feeling the tension between um, uh, whether or not there is a diagnosis um, that we haven't thought of yet or that hasn't been identified yet that can explain all this, or if a plausible diagnosis is already right in front of us. Um, because I think, you know, you, uh, we had talked about influenza and DAH being not classic, or being not um, common, but certainly plausible, particularly in somebody who has who is on Eliquis. And I think similarly, the LP findings with a little bit of a high protein and a relatively normal white count with some of these findings, thinking about, you know, is that a signal, is that a signal for the albuminocytologic dissociation, which is just a fancy way of saying high protein, relatively normal white count in the CSF as a, as a, um, a one of the discerning features of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, and Guillain-Barre has its sort of classic core phenotype, but there's a whole host of variations. There can be a pure motor variant, a pure sensory variant. Sometimes people develop cranial neuropathies, which the ptosis could be, could be evidence of. And so there's sort of as the hallmark one, and then a whole host of, of different syndromes, some of which are named like the Miller-Fisher syndrome. There's another one called Bickerstaff encephalitis that can involve primarily CNA or, uh, uh, CNS inflammation, encephalitis, and cranial neuropathies but all of them sort of collapse down to the same process. There is something that set off the immune system, whether that's another underlying autoimmune disease, an underlying infection or something else, and that's impacting the nervous system. And so if we look here, like it is totally plausible to me that flu could be something that a bad flu and a bad systemic flu could set off um, an autoimmune demyelinating neuropathy that could have some of these manifestations. And a bad flu in the right individual or severe influenza pneumonia could set off DAH and terrible respiratory failure. It would be sort of the edge range of this presentation, but certainly not, um, I, I, I think not like out of the box, atypical, but not impossible. And so I think contending with that tension, what it sort of leads me to do is be like, okay, well, we have that working hypothesis, but what are the things that we need to falsify uh, before we settle there? Um, and I think it's all the things that you mentioned, Sherman, right? Like small vessel vasculitides, lupus can have vascular and neurologic manifestations with it. Some of the complications of lupus, um, whether that's, um, yeah, maybe I'll just leave it with lupus can do it. Um, you know, there's other vascular disease like church strauss but we don't see eosinophilia. Anti-GBM disease can sometimes do it, but we don't see renal involvement here. And so I think sort of we would just really like, I guess I would sort of explore that list with you um, and maybe send off some of the other sort of influenza-like infections, CMV, HSV, BZV. But again, um, uh, in the absence of an immunocompromising condition that we haven't yet discovered, it's hard to imagine a 53-year-old having an explosive disseminated version of those infections just right off the bat. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of where I'm at. Like flu seems like a, you know, um, a, a compatible culprit, but um, we may want to settle on flu bef uh, uh, after we sort of formally, um, to the best that we can, falsify lupus, small vessel vascular disease, um, uh, and those other diseases. Um, I just want to, amazing discussion. Um, I just want to ask you both, I know I know we have thir like uh, 30 minutes. Do you guys want to split up the last Eloqua where I give you some more information or do you guys want me to give you guys the course? I'm good with that. What, are, what about you, Charmaine? Sounds great. So split it up just so you guys have more time. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. So um, when the patient had uh, a BAL that was consistent with um, kind of like, a uh, like a alveolar hemorrhage, a bunch of autoimmune serology was sent. ANA, ANCAs, C through C four, double strand antibody. They're all negative. Um, so there was really no. And then the UA was sent with microscopy. There was no cast. And like I said, the kidney function was basically at its baseline. Um, we repleted his vitamins and everything, both IV and, and oral, um, and it didn't made too much of a difference uh, with his overall presentation. Um, I'm gonna give you guys the uh, EMG and then I will hold back on the last test that came back positive, but the EMG will perhaps provide some good information. Um, so the EMG showed two main things. One was axonal polyneuropathy that was kind of diffuse and generalized. Um, and they also showed decrement with repetitive nerve stimulation. Interesting. Yeah. I, um, 
I think this is a, a humbling reminder that I, I, I am indeed not a neurologist. Um, but I think, you know, if I just go with word association, that decrement with repetitive nerve stimulation lands for me like fatigability. Um, uh, and it makes me think about myasthenia. Um, but I don't know what to make of everything else with myasthenia. Yeah, uh, I, I think my knowledge of myasthenia maybe stops at knowing some of the characteristic neurologic features. I'm not sure how it could also potentially play into this case overall. What do you think, Charmaine? Yeah, I think that's the one thing that came to my mind as well with the fatigability that is like my senior and thinking about like whether this is um, primary or secondary, uh, like is it um, kind of a perineoplastic syndrome and we still are not done digging um, would be um, kind of what I'm thinking about. But I'm super excited to learn from you. And yeah, I think that, the, yeah, I could have you all to have like thought so thoroughly about both infections and like autoimmune ideologies. Because yeah, I feel like for the DAH is really, really hard to ignore that autoimmune category. Um, uh, so yeah, um, yeah, it is quite interesting because I feel like yeah, the, uh, although with the myasthenia gravis, um, it would explain uh uh the neurological finding however we're still as you mentioned jack the dah might have been just a really bad infection uh, with influenza and then he's already on an anticoagulations however like the thing that i would be looking into would be kind of the overlap between like what can cause dah and perhaps like maybe a paraneoplastic or um like uh, my senior gravis which I don't know, uh, but that's the that's I think the space that I would want to explore more is that is there any link that would explain other than like two separate processes causing them or perhaps the infection setting everything up? Um, any other thoughts from you, Jack? No, I think with you just mentioning the myasthenia uh, or like the um, bringing back in the the perineoplastic part of it, I'm just trying to think like what cancers can cause a DAH syndrome, and I think in my mind it's like. Obviously, blood like vascular cancers, like angiosarcoma, APML can do it. And then I all, all I think about is just the cancers that can particularly bleed very bad, like melanoma um, as another one. But I can't say that I have an association of any of those cancers with myasthenia. And so I'm sort of I'm like, is this fatigability just a red herring? Um, uh, uh, or is it something that like we should be centered on? And because, I mean... Um, Compatible EMG, incompatible antibody studies is not a problem that I've contended with when thinking about myasthenia. So yeah, I'm, uh, uh, I think I'm stuck in terms of where to go next. Yeah. All right, um, great this, oh, sorry, go ahead. Chen. No, I was just gonna say, I totally agree. Oh, we are so excited to learn from you, Jazz. Um, great, so I think, um, you know, this is probably why I'm banned to present cases to RLR anymore. <laughs> but uh, so the cases that uh, this case I selected because this was um, a atypical presentation of a rare, rare condition, but then also had a lot of bread and butter medicine that can explain a lot of the patient's symptoms. So um, <laughs> uh, I saw your comment, Shema. Uh, so the and eventually the uh, LRP4 antibody would turn back positive. So in this case, when I was taking care of this patient, when I saw that the acetylcholine receptor antibody was negative, I was like, okay, like less likely to be mass than gravis, and we're waiting for like uh, the EMG to be done. But then when I saw the EMG results, I was like, huh. And then the neurologist said, like, let's send out a couple of these other serologies. And so this patient did have myasthenia gravis, and um, I, I, you guys have a lot of questions in the chat, so I'm going to help answer all of those. So the EMG polyneuropathy was attributed to the pyridoxine deficiency versus critical illness and prolonged immobilization, um, and the decrement is consistent with the myasthenia gravis. Neurology felt strongly that the <clears throat> pneumonia was a trigger for the myasthenia gravis, specifically the influenza virus. Um, uh, because prior to this, the patient did not have any myasthenic type of symptoms. Um, the influenza was the likely culprit between the abdominal pain, nausea, nausea vomiting. Um, he, because of the bulbar symptoms, likely bulbar symptoms and weak, weakening muscles, he probably aspirated, um, which led to probably a form of necrotizing pneumonia. 
um, and may have explained, plus him being on So you guys mentioned from the very beginning, his eloquence put him at risk for um, having some uh, hemor uh, def uh, alveolar hemorrhage. So it was multifactorial, a lot of bread and butter things that could explain his, his overall symptoms. And then basically looking at, well, well, why is he having these like myalgia, like sorry, this like weakness and then the ptosis. And surprisingly, his ice pack test was positive. So that was the other thing. So we've got an ice pack um, uh, put on, on both of his eyelids. They improved, which is another um, basically a bedside test you could do for myasthenes gravis. So just some to complete the overall picture, <clears throat> uh, which this is brand new information for me, that uh, so when it comes to the antibodies, um, you know they can be used to confirm um, myasthenic gravis diagnosis. Acetylcholine receptor antibodies are present eighty five percent of the time, so that's the one that we associate it with. That's the one we're all taught in med school. However, MUSK antibodies are also present about eight percent of the time. LRP4 antibodies are, pre are present 1% of the time. So this was a pretty atypical. In fact, seronegative myasthenus gravis, but EMG findings consistent with myasthenus gravis is actually possible 6% of the time. So you being seronegative is more common than having LRP4 antibody. And the presence of M MUSK antibody positive myasthenus gravis is most likely to present with just oculobobular uh, with diplopia and ptosis and dysarthria and not have generalized myasthenus gravis. With patients who have LR, LRP4 antibody, they present with mild ocular symptoms. However, they have more severe clinical symptoms generalized than those without LRP4 antibodies. And we always associate the thymoma with the my myasthenus gravis. Usually they're not that common. And if you do see a thymoma, it is basically almost always, so 98 to 100% of the time, you will have a acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myasthenus gravis. Um, patients with seronegative myasthenus gravis, uh, interestingly, have purely ocular disease and those who, uh, compared to those who are seropositive. And apparently, um, this cohort of patients also have better response to immunosuppressive treatment. That's my end of my teaching point. <clears throat> Um, thank you so much, Jazz. This is such an educational case. I have a lot to reflect on. Um, and yeah, atypical presentations. And I love what you said. Like, I think like the road to rare diseases is through a typical presentation of common diseases. And then when you get to rare diseases, you have to consider atypical. So kudos for you all to just keep investigating as to why this patient is having these symptoms and not um not stopping um, when the myasthenia gravis antibodies came back and negative and uh, revisiting that when the AMG came back. Um, this was incredibly educational. And yeah, like the DAH uh, and all of this being said by the infection. Uh, yeah, poor guy. I hope he's doing okay. He's been through the ringer. Thank you so much for sharing this case. Um, I always learn so much from you as shown by this case. Uh, thank you so much to Elena for um, uh, scribing and uh, Julia. I'm so excited for you to walk us through this really challenging and awesome case. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Jess, for the presentation. It was very exciting. Everyone was uh, humbling with like getting to the right diagnosis. And I think everybody learned a lot. And I tried to summarize very briefly what I what my uh, main takeaway points are from this case. So first, uh, we learned that we should, when we have like different uh, symptoms, we should concentrate on the most specific one and most morbid one to narrow down our, our differential. So in, in this case, we had a um, a patient with abdominal pain, vomiting and we weakness. And the most uh, specific one would be the abdominal pain, which we try to focus on. Also, we should think about the other symptoms being a sequelae of the like main presenting symptoms. That was our first approach. Then we were to try to narrow down our, our differentials and trying to think about um, causes of um, DAH, so diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. So we thought about many differentials, but it helped us like getting orientated in the case. So we should think about medication. This guy took oral anticoagulants 
anticoagulation, which prone him to um, lung bleeding. Also, we should think about small vessel vasculitis, vasculitis like GPA, MPA, anti-GBM. Also, and uh, it's never lupus, but sometimes it is. So think about SLE. Also, infection, uh, mostly leptospirosis, v VZV, but also influence that can lead to bleeding in the lung. Um, don't forget perineoplastic causes um, and cancers that can lead to DAH. Then um, Jack and Termin did an awesome uh, job in uh, creating their Venn diagrams to narrow down the differentials. So we thought about what... Um, what diagnosis can combine like vasculitis and abdominal pain? And then we thought about polyarthritis nodosa. Also, when we have vasculitis and neuropathy, we should think about small vessel uh, vasculitis like GPA. Um, in um, When we have ascending demyelating peri um, peripheral neuropathy, um, Guillaume Barry would be like a very common presenting um uh, diagnosis in this case it ca it has like very different manifestations um also do do not forget um any damage of anterior horn cells um that can le lead to the neurologic sy symptoms of this patients well when we when we think about pre uh, peripheral neurological processes we try to uh, keep per infections uh and also perineoplastic uh, symptoms in mind. Our patients had a low vitamin by uh, B6, and we were thinking whether this could be the cause of the neurological symptoms, but we'd rather narrow it down to paresthesia being a symptoms, but not the weakness and um, dropped reflexes. One very important general um, hint that Jack mentioned, I thought, was to falsify the morbid and do not miss differentials before we really narrow down to uh, the most likely diagnosis in this case. Um, and in the end, Jazz helped us out um, and, and solved the case um, in which he, he taught us about a like, very rare disease and rare presentation um, where an influenza, so pneumonia, can trigger myasthenia gravis, especially when an influenza is um, um, in the background. And in combination with anticoagulation, it can lead to um, a necrotizing pneumonia and bleeding in the lung. He also taught us about um, antibodies. So not only in 85%, we have the AC. HR antibodies, especially when we have a thymomer in the background, but we can also have like the mask antibodies in 8%. And what I want to mention, lastly, what I found very interesting that we, if we have a positive EMG and a negative um, serolog serology, we have um, the, we can diagnose uh, myasthenia gravis and that's in 6%, so even more likely than the presentation of this guy. So thank you, everybody. I've learned a lot. Thank you, Jess. Th thank you, Jack and Charmaine. Um, It was a lot of fun to learn from all you guys. And um, also the chat was on fire like always. So thank you, everybody. Julia, that was fantastic. Uh, thank you for the superb teaching points. It's just mine boggling to me how do you all do it so fast and so well um and thank you again jazz what a case and shout out to elena for uh subscribing and thank you all so much for joining us we'll see you tomorrow bye